Readings of Almighty God's Words The Responsibilities of Leaders and Workers The Responsibilities of Leaders and Workers 20 Now in the church, various people have already been revealed and grouped according to kind. Everyone should be classified according to their type, and there are principles and administrative decrees in God's house regulating how to treat and handle different types of people. God has patience and tolerance, mercy and loving kindness, and a righteous disposition. But don't forget that God also has wrath and majesty. Some people say, God wants every person to be saved and does not want anyone to suffer perdition. This is true, but God desires every person to be saved, not everything or every devil. When people suffer perdition, God feels sorrow and grief. When devils suffer perdition, it is their rightful end and deserved punishment. God does not grieve for them. This is God's disposition and His principle in dealing with people. People always want to contradict God, thinking that those disbelievers, evil people, and antichrists are also humans. They believe that those who consistently disrupt and disturb the church's work are also humans. Those who vie for status and establish independent kingdoms are also humans, and those who consistently engage in promiscuity are also humans. They list all these devilish types among God's chosen people. Isn't this absurd? Doesn't this go against what God desires? Because their viewpoints on matters completely contradict God's words and the truth, their opinions on various negative figures devils, and satans are entirely opposite to God's words, differing greatly. God has never treated the devils following Satan as humans. How does God define these people? They are lackeys of the devil Satan. They are beasts, false leaders, out of their good intentions and muddled love, and compelled by their own wishful thinking. Treat these disbelievers, devils, and lackeys of Satan as brothers and sisters. Therefore, they show them great love and kindness, constantly helping and supporting them. As a result, because false leaders extend their support, help, and leadership to those people, the true brothers and sisters, the ones God wants to save, are severely perturbed. Church life can never enter onto the right track, and the brothers and sisters can never normally eat and drink God's words and fellowship the truth without any disturbance from evil people. Isn't this the accomplishment of false leaders? Their accomplishment is quite significant. Not only do they fail to protect the brothers and sisters, but they also afford unwarranted respect and protection to those evil people and antichrists. Isn't this disrupting the church's work? The nature of false leaders doing this is disruption, yet they think they are maintaining the church's work and helping and supporting God's chosen people. How does God view these actions of false leaders? God detests them. He especially detests them. False leaders do not do actual work, but focus on safeguarding evil people, acting as lackeys of Satan. This leads to God's chosen people, those who love the truth, being unable to receive the support and sustenance of the church despite living church life, and wanting to do their duties yet being unable to have their safety guaranteed. False leaders are completely oblivious to these matters and think, I treat everyone equally, 
So why are you complaining? Just what do I have to do to satisfy you? This is what it means to treat people fairly. You are just being picky and hard to please. Anyway, I am accountable to God. I am doing everything before God. Aren't they impervious to reason for being able to spout such rhetoric? Are they not foolish to the extreme? They are indeed impervious to reason and foolish to the extreme. God's house talks every day about how God saves humankind, but false leaders never understand God's words. They think that no matter who the person is, no matter what their essence is, no matter how evil the things they have done were, and no matter how malicious their humanity is, under the guidance of God's words and with the help of people's loving support, they will eventually repent and turn back. Isn't this viewpoint completely wrong? Aside from having a severely fallacious comprehension of God's words, false leaders also pretend to understand God's intentions and, thinking in a unilateral way and operating upon their own selfish desires, they show kindness and love to evil people and antichrists. And what is the result? They end up shielding evil people and antichrists, becoming their accomplices, providing opportunities, and a breeding ground for them to disrupt and disturb the church's work and church life. Meanwhile, the brothers and sisters who truly need protection are ignored by the false leaders, who never ask them, how do you feel about having these evil people and antichrists in the church and those venting negativity and spreading notions? Do you agree with keeping them in the church? Are you willing to do your duties and live church life together with them? They never ask how the brothers and sisters feel about any of this. What do you think? Aren't such leaders and workers quite disgusting? They operate under the banner of being leaders and workers, wearing such titles, but they are actually doing the work of safeguarding Satan and Satan's lackeys. It's truly sad. If you say that such leaders and workers have poor caliber and do not do actual work, they might be unconvinced. They will feel wronged, thinking they are busy every day and not idle. So how can it be that they do not do actual work? But based on their manifestations, feeling both groups of people are important, thinking both must be treated equally, using fair treatment as an excuse to allow evil people and those who disrupt and disturb to domineer in the church and letting various evil deeds persist in the church. What are these leaders and workers? Based on their manifestations, their way and principles of working, and their motives for doing work, they are unmistakably false leaders and muddle-headed fools. Is it accurate to say this? In society, regardless of which group or class of people it is, they do not distinguish between evil people and good people much less do they discuss how Satan corrupts people or what the essence of corrupt humankind is. They do not even differentiate between good and evil. But in God's house, everything is based on God's words. The truth never changes, and God's words accomplish everything. In the church, all kinds of people are revealed by God's words and they are naturally grouped, each according to their kind. All kinds of people should be put to the best use based on their humanity, pursuits, and essence. Is this classifying people by rank? It is not classifying people by rank, but categorizing them. Each person should be grouped according to their kind. 
they should be placed where they belong. Mixing together is not acceptable. Mixing is temporary and has a fixed period. For example, when tares and wheat are mixed together, if pulling the tares affects the wheat and may cause the wheat to die, then the tares are not to be pulled yet. But not pulling them doesn't mean they're not categorized. So when should they be pulled? At the right time. God will prepare the time. Now is the time for each to be grouped according to their kind. All kinds of people must be categorized. This is necessary. Why must this work be done? From a theoretical perspective, there is the basis of God's words. From the perspective of the actual situation, it is necessary to do this. It has practical value and it is essential to do so. When pulling the tares does not affect the wheat, the tares must be pulled out and separated from the wheat. If disbelievers and evil people, those who correspond to tares, are treated as brothers and sisters, it is too unfair to all the brothers and sisters who sincerely expend themselves for God. For one thing, these people will often be disturbed, influenced, and harmed by evil people who disrupt and disturb the church's work. For another, some people with small stature do not understand the truth and will be constrained, become negative and weak, or even stumble when they come into contact with evil people who disrupt and disturb. Moreover, Everything that those who disrupt and disturb do, and every word they say, bring about chaos, mess, and disorderly situations. The most realistic situation is that when they do a duty or do some work, they recklessly commit misdeeds and do not follow principles, leading to copious waste of manpower, material resources, and financial resources without achieving any results. In the end, what happens? When they are dismissed, everyone has to pay for their evil deeds. The work needs to be redone, and the manpower, material resources, time, and the most precious energy of everyone expended, before those individuals were dismissed, are wasted due to their reckless misdeeds and cannot be compensated. The negative impact they brought to this work is too great. No one can bear this responsibility. Even if the work is done well later, the previous losses cannot be compensated by anyone. Some people say to make them pay money. This ought to be done too. But can money buy time? Can money buy the time and energy of the brothers and sisters, or the sincere price they paid? No, it cannot. Those are priceless. No matter how many people cause disruptions and disturbances in the church, the consequences are immeasurable. Numerous brothers and sisters' life entry will be impacted. The loss is significant and cannot be compensated. Can the loss to the brother's and sister's life be compensated? Who will pay for this loss? So, these evil people must be cleared out. They are not of the same kind as the brothers and sisters who pursue the truth. They belong to the cohort of devils and Satan, coming to God's house to disturb and destroy. If these evil people are not cleared out of the church, the work of the church and the order of church life can never be guaranteed. Regardless of how many people make up a certain group, as long as there is one person among them disrupting and disturbing, someone who recklessly commits misdeeds, never handles matters according to principles, never accepts positive things or the truth, listens to no one, acts with willful arbitrariness,
regardless of whether they have any status or power, and is essentially a living Satan. Such a person, as long as they stay in the church, will sooner or later bring great disturbance and destruction to the church's work. When the day comes to clear them out and handle them, how many people will have to clean up the evil consequences and the disorderly situations they have caused? Therefore, clearing out or expelling these evil people and antichrists is an important task that leaders and workers should undertake and must not be careless about. However, false leaders show kindness and love to those who should be cleared out or expelled, turn a blind eye to their evil deeds, tolerate and accommodate them as brothers and sisters, and even regard those who are useful to them as talented people and cultivate and use them. No matter what bad things they do, false leaders find excuses to exonerate them and even give loving help and support to them. On some level, isn't this deliberate disruption? False leaders act according to their own ideas and their own kindness and enthusiasm ultimately causing great trouble for the church and God's chosen people. If these evil people hold power, the disasters and consequences they bring to the church are incalculable. There is currently a regulation in God's house that no matter who commits misdeeds, so long as it causes a loss to God's house, they must compensate for it. If the loss is too great and the consequences are severe, can the problem be solved just by compensating with money? Some losses cannot be made up for by any amount of monetary compensation. They are irreparable and irretrievable. Each day is now very precious and crucial. Once a day has passed, can that time be regained? That is also irretrievable. Why do we say that missing out on certain things is a lifelong regret? Precisely because time cannot be regained. What do I mean by saying this? It is best to prevent problems before they occur, rather than spending money to solve them after they happen. This is the best way to solve problems. Locking the stable door after the horse has bolted is a last resort. It is best to do preventive work before things happen. This means that before any disruptions or disturbances occur, leaders and workers must have clear discernment and a thorough understanding of the various types of people in the church and carefully observe and promptly grasp the states, dispositions, and pursuits of various kinds of people, as well as their attitudes and viewpoints while doing duty, to ensure that all the brothers and sisters have a normal church life and environment for doing their duties. This way, the church's work can progress in an orderly manner. These are the responsibilities of leaders and workers. Of course, False leaders are not up to this work. They are muddle-headed fools and useless people. Now they have a clever idea. Anyone who does not follow the principles and bungles the work will be fined. If an antichrist does something wrong, they will be fined. They think that issuing fines is the best solution and the best principle of practice. If all problems could be solved by issuing fines, what would be the use of pursuing the truth? Why is a false leader called false? It is because they do not understand the truth and they treat following regulations as practicing the truth and regard the words and doctrines they understand as the truth. And when things happen, they absolutely cannot find the correct principles or direction and cannot resolve problems from the root. They do not understand God's words 
and cannot grasp what God means at all, but still want to work and be a leader or worker. How foolish! In this regard, what is the main manifestation of a false leader? They cannot see through to the essence of the various kinds of people who disrupt and disturb the work of the church, cannot categorize them, and certainly cannot treat and handle them according to principles. In the mind of a false leader, all these are a confused mess. They speculate about God's words and what He means based on their enthusiasm and their own notions and imaginings. At the same time, they impose their kindness, enthusiasm, and personal imaginings and notions onto God, believing that these things align with the truth, align with God's intentions, and can represent what God desires. Thus, they rely on these things to work and lead God's chosen people. This is the main manifestation of a false leader. We will conclude our fellowship on the second manifestation of false leaders here. Next, we shall fellowship on the third manifestation of false leaders, which is ignoring and not inquiring about people who disrupt and disturb the church's work, even when they discover that evil people and antichrists are disturbing the church's work. They do not pay attention to it. This is more serious in nature than the first two manifestations. Why is it said to be more serious? The first two manifestations involve the caliber of false leaders, but this manifestation involves the humanity of false leaders. Some false leaders have such poor caliber that they cannot see through the nature of disrupting and disturbing the church's work. Some false leaders, although they can discover the problems of disrupting and disturbing the church's work, unfortunately do not understand the truth and cannot handle and resolve these problems. They always act according to their own ideas and enthusiasm, doing what they like to do, thinking in their hearts, as long as I am doing the church's work, it's fine. As for who disrupts and disturbs, that is their personal matter and has nothing to do with me. There are also some false leaders who have a bit of caliber and can do a bit of work, and who know a bit about the principles for handling each sort of person. However, they are afraid of offending people, so when they discover evil people and antichrists causing disruptions and disturbances, they do not dare to expose, stop, or restrict them. They live by satanic philosophies, and they turn a blind eye to matters that they feel have nothing to do with them. They don't care at all about what the results of the church's work are like, or how much the life entry of God's chosen people is impacted. They think such things have nothing to do with them. So, during such a false leader's tenure, the normal order of church life is not maintained, and the duties and life entry of God's chosen people are not protected. What is the nature of this problem? It is not the case that these false leaders cannot do work because their caliber is poor. It is because their humanity is poor, and they lack conscience and reason that they do not do real work. In what way are false leaders false? They lack the conscience and reason of humanity. Therefore, during their time working as leaders, the issue of evil people and antichrists disrupting and disturbing the church's work is not resolved at all. Some brothers and sisters are greatly harmed and the work of the church also suffers tremendous losses. When this sort of false leader notices a problem, when they see an evil person or an antichrist causing a disruption or a disturbance, they know what their responsibility is, what they should do, and how they should do it. 
yet they do nothing at all, and they even play dumb, completely ignore it, and do not report the matter to their superiors. They pretend that they know nothing and see nothing, allowing evil people and antichrists to disrupt and disturb the work of the church. Is there not a problem with their humanity? Are they not of the same camp as evil people and antichrists? What is the principle of their leadership? I cause no disruptions or disturbances, but I won't do anything that gives offense or anything that hurts the dignity of others. Characterize me as a false leader, and I still won't do anything that gives offense. I need to leave myself a way out. What sort of logic is this? It is the logic of Satan. And what sort of disposition is this? Is it not very sly and deceitful? Such a person is not the least bit sincere in their treatment of God's commission. They are always wily and slippery in the performance of their duty, with so many nasty calculations, thinking of themselves in all things. They give not the least thought to the work of the church and have no conscience or reason at all. They are fundamentally unworthy of serving as church leader. Such people do not have the slightest burden for the church's work or the life entry of God's chosen people. They only care about their own interests and enjoyment. They focus solely on indulging in the benefits of status without any concern for what condition God's chosen people are in. Isn't this the most selfish and despicable person? Even when they discover evil people and antichrists disturbing the church's work, they do not pay attention to it, as if these matters have nothing to do with them. It's like a shepherd who sees a wolf eating the sheep but does nothing, only caring about preserving their own life. Such a person is not qualified to be a shepherd. Everything this type of false leader does is to maximize the protection of their own reputation, status, power, and the various benefits they currently enjoy. They have no burden in their hearts for God's commission, the church's work, or the life entry of God's chosen people, which are their duties and responsibilities. They never consider these. They think, why must a leader do these tasks? Why does not doing these tasks result in being pruned and condemned and rejected by the brothers and sisters? They do not understand and are completely indifferent. In my heart, no matter how well behaved this sort of person appears, or how rule-abiding, or taciturn, or hard-working and competent, the fact that they act without principles and take no responsibility for the work of the church obliges me to see them in a new light. Finally, I define this sort of person like so. They may not make any big mistakes, but they are very sly and deceitful. They do not take on any responsibility at all, nor do they uphold the work of the church at all. They have no humanity. I feel that they are like a sort of animal. In their cunning, they are a bit like the fox. People say that foxes are cunning, but in fact, these people are even more cunning than foxes. On the surface, it seems like they haven't done any evil, but in fact, everything they say and do is for their own fame, gain, and status. Everything they do is for the purpose of enjoying the benefits of their status, and they do not consider God's intentions at all. They do not resolve the problems that arise in the church's work one bit, nor do they address actual issues concerning the life entry of God's chosen people. These false leaders do not do any work to lead God's chosen people into the truth reality. Just what is the purpose of everything they do? 
Isn't it just to please people and make others regard them highly? They try to make everyone think well of them without offending anyone, thus enjoying their reputation and the benefits of their status. What most inspires hatred about them is that all their actions bring no benefit to the life entry of God's chosen people. Instead, they mislead people, making others admire and idolize them. Are these people not even more sly and deceitful than foxes? They are textbook, genuine false leaders. They have the status of leader and hold this title, but do not do any actual work, only taking care of some visible, superficial general affairs. Or they reluctantly do a bit of the work specially assigned by the above. If there is no special assignment from the above, they do not do any essential work of the church. Regarding matters that involve maintaining the church's work and the order of church life, they are afraid of offending people and dare not uphold principles. They do not solve any of the accumulated problems in the church's work. And even when they see the assets of God's house being squandered by antichrists and evil people, they do nothing to stop or restrict it. In their hearts, they clearly know these people are doing evil and harming the interests of God's house. Yet they play dumb, not saying a word. These are the sly and deceitful people. Are these people not more cunning than foxes? They are outwardly amiable to everyone and do not do things to harm anyone, but they delay the major matter of the life entry of God's chosen people, the church's work, and the work of spreading the gospel. Are such people worthy of being leaders and workers? Are they not Satan's lackeys? Are they not the ones disrupting and disturbing the church's work? Although on the surface they have not committed any obvious evil, the consequences of their working like this are even more severe than committing evil. They hinder the carrying out of God's will, resist God, and disrupt and disturb the church's work. They harm God's chosen people and can even destroy the hope of God's chosen people being saved. Tell me, is this not committing evil? This is exactly what a people pleaser who does not uphold principles at all does. People who do not understand the truth cannot thoroughly perceive the terrible consequences of false leaders working this way nor can they grasp what their intentions, motives, and purposes are. You will never fathom what they really want to do in their hearts. Such people are too sly. Figuratively speaking, they are sly foxes. Accurately speaking, they are living devils, living devils among people. When it comes to how these false leaders should be characterized based on their disposition essence, they cannot be arbitrarily placed within the categories of evil people, antichrists, hypocrites, and so on. However, judging from what they manifest, like the manifestations of their humanity and their attitude toward the church's work, as well as them not addressing problems they discover, they are the most depraved sort of false leaders. Judging by their various manifestations, although they do not proactively form cliques or establish their own independent kingdoms and rarely testify to themselves, and although they can get along well with the brothers and sisters, endure hardship, pay a price, refrain from stealing offerings, and even strictly restrain themselves from seeking special privileges. Nevertheless, when they face the various people, events, and things that disrupt and disturb the church's work, 
or the various people who squander offerings and damage the property of God's house. They do not stop or handle them. They do not say anything or do any work. Such people are terrifying. They are the most despicable type of false leaders. They are irredeemable. Why do I say that they are irredeemable? It is not the case that they have poor caliber or that they cannot comprehend God's words. They do have a certain comprehension ability and work capability. But when they discover someone disrupting and disturbing the church's work, they do not handle or resolve it. They only reluctantly do a bit of this work when they meet with the strict supervision and frequent inquiries of their superior leaders or when they have been pruned. No matter whether they do this work or not, or how they do it, protecting themselves is their top priority. They do not fulfill the responsibilities of leaders and workers at all. Aside from protecting themselves and maintaining their own interests, they do no essential work, and they only perform a bit of superficial work that they have no choice but to do. Other than protecting themselves, they don't care about anything else. Aren't they slyer and craftier than a fox? Some people say, it is a fox's instinct to eat small animals. So isn't it also the instinct of false leaders to protect themselves? Is this an instinct? This is their nature. These false leaders protect their own status, reputation, and face, maintain relationships with people, and avoid offending anyone at the cost of harming the interests of God's house and damaging the church's work. They don't even personally handle the dismissal or adjustment of personnel, instead assigning others to do it for them. They think, if that person seeks revenge, they won't come after me. I need to protect myself first in any situation I encounter. These people are far too sly. As leaders and workers, they can't even take on this responsibility. So are they worthy of being leaders? They are just useless cowards. Without this bit of courage, are they still believers in God? Are people who resort to trickery to shirk their responsibilities in doing their duties followers of God? God does not want such people. These false leaders are as sly and crafty as foxes. When they see someone causing a disruption or a disturbance, they neither handle nor resolve it. They simply don't do actual work. No matter how they are exposed and pruned, they don't act. Since they don't fulfill the responsibilities of leaders and workers, why are they occupying that position? Is it so they can be part of the decor? Is it so they can indulge in the benefits of status? They are not qualified for that. Not doing actual work yet wanting the brothers and sisters to revere and idolize them. Isn't this the mindset of a devil? It is so shameless. Some people say they do not want to be a leader at all. Then why do they maintain their reputation and status? What is their purpose in misleading people? If they do not want to be a leader, they can proactively resign. Why don't they resign? Why do they occupy that position and not step down? If they don't want to resign, then they must dutifully do some actual work. There is no other choice. This is their responsibility. If they can't do actual work, it'd be best for them to take accountability and resign. They should not delay the church's work or harm God's chosen people. If they lack even this bit of conscience and reason, 
Do they still have any humanity? They are unworthy of being called human. Regardless of whether they can be a leader or worker, people who believe in God only deserve to be called human if they have at least a bit of conscience and reason. To be a leader or worker, one needs to possess a certain level of caliber. A person's caliber determines their work capability and the extent to which they grasp the truth principles. If your caliber is somewhat lacking and you do not have a deep enough comprehension of the truth, but you are able to practice as much as you can understand, and you can put into practice what you understand, and in your heart you are pure and honest, and do not scheme for anything on your own behalf or pursue fame, gain, and status, and you can accept God's scrutiny then you are a right person. However, false leaders do not possess these qualities. They do not concern themselves with the various problems of disruptions and disturbances that arise in the church. Even if they notice these problems, they pay them no mind. If you ask them whether they are aware of the situation, they say, I think I know a bit about it but not everything. This happened right under their noses. Why do they say they don't know about it? Aren't they trying to trick people? Since they do know about it, have they thought about how to handle it? Have they done any work? Have they tried to come up with any solutions? They reply, that person's caliber is better than mine and they're articulate and well-spoken. I don't dare interfere with them. What if I address something that's not actually an issue and offend them? That would make my work difficult afterward. Since they don't dare, they are useless cowards and derelict in their duty, and they are unworthy of being leaders. When they encounter this kind of situation, do they know how to handle it? They say, even though I know how to handle it, I don't dare. Isn't that what the above is for? And there's the decision-making group too. How could I be the one that this task falls to? Since they saw it and know about it, they should handle this situation. If their stature is too small and they can't deal with this issue, have they told their superiors about the problem? Have they reported it? Have they done that which comes under the scope of their responsibilities and the work that falls to them? Have they fulfilled any of their responsibilities at all? Not at all. In their hearts, they know full well, I knew about this issue, but I didn't act. I feel guilty. I should have reported that matter, but didn't. But other people didn't do it either. What does it have to do with me? Are other people also leaders? Whether other people do it or not is those people's business. Why haven't these leaders done it? If other people don't do it, does that mean these leaders don't have to do it? Is this the truth? Even if other people had done it, could that be a substitute for these leaders doing it? What these leaders do is their own business. Have they fulfilled their responsibilities and obligations? If they have not, then they are derelict in their duty, unqualified to be leaders, and they should take accountability and resign. They have no appreciation for how they have been lifted up. They are unworthy of the trust of the brothers and sisters. They are unworthy of the trust of God's house. And they are even more unworthy of God's exaltation. They are heartless wretches. The third type of false leader has a problem with their character. 
regardless of how their personal pursuits and life entry are, just judging from the fact that during their tenure they do no actual work, do not recover any losses for the church, and certainly aren't able to promptly stop or handle the evil deeds of evil people. This type of person not only has a problem with poor caliber and a problem with not doing actual work, but most importantly, they have no humanity. Their conscience is utterly rotten, and they have no reason whatsoever. In common parlance, they are morally bankrupt. They are selfish and despicable to the extreme, and they are not trustworthy. Among the three types of people we have dissected, the humanity of this type is the worst. The first two types of people have poor caliber. They cannot do work, and they do not meet the principles and standards of God's house for cultivating and promoting people, so they cannot be cultivated or used. Their caliber is extremely poor. They are blind and numb, and they are practically dead people. They are not worth exposing and dissecting. The third type of person is the most vile. They are extremely despicable in terms of their humanity, and we characterize this type as sly and crafty. These people are even slyer than foxes. They do no actual work, yet have plenty of excuses and feel completely at ease. Regardless of how evil people and antichrists disturb the church's work, they do not get anxious or worried about it and still want to continue being leaders. Why are they so addicted to power? These leaders say, man struggles upward, water flows downward, everyone loves power. They do not want to do any actual work, but they still wish to cling to their position and enjoy the benefits of their status. What sort of wretch is this? They are purely the ilk of Satan. They are absolutely not anything good. Today we fellowshiped three points about the twelfth responsibility of leaders and workers. The false leaders we dissected in the twelfth responsibility are basically the same as the false leaders we exposed before. Although we dissected three points, they mainly cover two problems. One is that they have poor caliber and cannot do actual work. The other is that their humanity is vile, despicable, sly, and crafty, and they do not do actual work. These are the fundamental, essential problems of false leaders. As long as someone has one of these two problems, they are a false leader. This is beyond all doubt.